Normally I'm not one to snoop around in my son's business, but when he doesn't leave his room for over a good 12 hours, I have an excuse. It was around 8 p.m. and my son had been in his room playing video games since 7 a.m. I'd heard him scream a few times throughout the day, but recently he'd been getting into horror games and that was now a normal occurrence, so I thought nothing of it. But since he'd been in there literally all day, without leaving once, I needed to take an intervention. I opened the door casually, calling out his name. Him not answering was my first clue something was wrong. I checked his bed, closet, and even shelves and cabinets, but there weren't any clues as to where he could have been. Getting frantic he'd been kidnapped or worse, I decided instead to dwell on the thought that he may just be outside or in another room, and I just didn't hear him sneak out like he usually does. Before I left, I couldn't help noticing his GameCube. The controller was still on the bed, as if he'd just been playing it. Feeling sneaky like it was my responsibility, I turned the station on to play whatever game was in it, just for a bit, just to see how it kept my son's attention for 12 hours. I felt a wave of nostalgia as the game started up, of when I used to play games with my son all the time. After I tested a quick sample of whatever this was, I vowed to play a little with my son. He needed someone to be himself with anyways especially with how depressed he's been recently. I was so caught up in my thoughts, the title screen music took me a bit by surprise. After a moment, I realized it was Pokemon Channel. I remembered how much my son used to love playing that game. Maybe he was just getting re-addicted to playing it. Uh, whatever the case, there was only a new game option, so I selected it. I found myself in what looked like a bedroom. The only thing about this room was that the walls appeared to be drenched in blood and contained morbid little Pikachu dolls littering throughout it, plus a less than appealing Pikachu head as a TV. No wonder my son was screaming earlier. Fighting down my nausea, I looked around the room. After a while, the red everywhere and the sharp fang scare wore off. and. I could examine with more ease. I noticed a picture of Jirachi hanging on the wall. It was one of the few Pokemon I knew right off the bat since it was one of my son's favorites. The picture would have actually been pretty if it didn't have a large red X over it with bloodied claw marks. A bit scared to examine the rest of the game world, I instead opened the start menu to find what looked like a diary or journal of some sorts. There appeared to be entries in it, so I read through as the menu closed without my command. I came face to face with a Pikachu, who looked like he wasn't very pleased. It scowled at me and the GameCube shut off. I was a bit insulted of all things and quickly turned the system back on. Soon I was back in action in the room. The Pikachu wasn't there anymore. The room was still the same, Pikachu dolls staring me down, so I swiveled the screen around to the back of the room to find myself freeze in fear. There was a Jirachi floating in front of the door. Its eyes were closed, but the one on its stomach was wide open and rendered realistically. The eye looked like it was cracked and broken, and from that it was bleeding. I also noted the colors of it were grayscale, but I was too preoccupied staring at the eye, which was staring straight back at me. I cannot describe the relief I felt when that thing left. I realized I'd been holding my breath and let it out. It felt like an icy claw had been holding a grip on me. And now that it had released me, I wanted to take the opportunity and turn this thing off. But something compelled me to keep going. I just decided if that thing popped up again, this game was going in the trash. Pika! I turned around to find the Pikachu staring at me with a melancholy face, standing in front of the TV. 
It glared at me, then went to turn the TV off. I followed it, a bit scared of what it might do if I didn't. Plus, I'd rather be with the cute and cuddly creature than that disturbing eyeball creature. It changed the channel to PNF, which according to the game was the news. It zoomed into a duck Pokemon, which didn't say or do anything. I think it was called Psyduck. Playing the game was starting to recharge my old Pokemon knowledge. It then panned to a news station screen, which showed that Jirachi floating through a crimson carcass-strewn meadow, a burning forest, bloody beach, a dead snowy mountain, and made sure to get it at a lot of angles. The Jirachi finally stopped in the middle of the darkness and turned to face me. The Psyduck's eyes suddenly went black and turned to face the screen. In the text box, where there had previously been nothing, something appeared. Save X. The Pikachu quickly changed the channel to the egg channel, whatever that was. There was a white egg wiggling around in a void of darkness. It had cracks and blood dripping from them. It wobbled back and forth very slowly, almost painfully. I didn't want to know what was going to hatch from that thing. And apparently, the Pikachu had the same thoughts as it turned the TV off. Back in the center of the room, the screen panned towards the Pikachu and a text box appeared with, River wants to know if you'll play with him. O, X. Assuming O was for yes and X was for no, I selected O. Starting to get into the game, despite how unnerving it was, it panned away from Briver, and he grinned, showing off his toothy fangs. Another text at the top of the screen. You're going to regret that. And I sure as hell did. He went outside and I followed along behind, although I didn't have much choice as the game made me. It wasn't much prettier outside than inside. The sky was blood red, although it was prettier than the dead Pokemon bodies lying everywhere. He didn't seem to be phased at the scene as much as I was, and just went along to the meadow next door. This field wasn't much different blood and bodies, although there was a hole in the ground, which Briver seemed to take interest in. He reached into it and pulled out one of those unsettling, realistically rendered eyes like on the Jirachi. He threw the eye at me, which I casually let fall to the ground. And Briver shook his head and glared. Catch it and throw it to Briver, the text informed me. I grimaced and moused over the dead eye to pick it up. Instead, I picked up a dead Poochiana body which I quickly dropped back to the ground. Briver doubled over laughing on the other side of the screen, to which I glared at him. He grinned and made a motion eager for me to pass the eyeball. I selected it and threw it as fast as I could without looking at the screen. When I looked again, Briver was holding it and threw it back. I ran over to the other side of the screen so I wouldn't have to see it. The screen faded to black, then back, and I assumed the minigame sequence was over, although Brever was still holding the eyeball. Then without any warning whatsoever, he ate it. Pika, 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 choo! I sat there disgusted as he finished it off, grinning afterwards. The screen suddenly shifted to black, then back once again. Except when it came to, the sky was dark gray, and everything else was a darker tint. Brever's smug grin was now melancholy once more. He walked back through the meadow, into the house very slow, with the same gloomy expression all the way almost like a zombie. 
If anything, it was more disturbing than his previous morbid mode. Once back at Dikasa, everything was bright and uncheery once more. I noticed a trail of blood on the floor that wasn't there previously. I followed it over to a small closet-like compartment. And preparing myself for the worst, I opened it. Inside the walls were covered in blood. With a pile of skitty limbs and guts on the floor, head adorned on top. I barely had three seconds to look at this sight before Brever ran over and shut the closet door. He made a threatening growl at me, then ran to the back door and outside to the bus stop, I tagging along behind. Out at the bus stop, the sky was red and the environment throbbing once more. The bus to Viridian Forest pulled up and we got on it, even though I didn't select it, but I was accustomed to this by now. After a what would be innocent cutscene, we arrived to a forest set aflame, charred bodies littering the ground. Picking our way through the landscape with ease, well, River did so with ease. We went to the other side of the forest. Here, it was like a campsite, except a large bonfire in the middle was a pile of fleshy, burning bodies, all set alight and fueling the flame. There was also a projector which, after a quick tinkering by Brever, turned to the starry sky. A movie started playing and I braced myself for the worst. It delivered. Most of the movie was buggy and glitchy, but from what I could tell it was mainly other Pokemon being brutally maimed and killed. Dead, bloody carcasses, pretty much everything I'd seen up to that point, just in different poses and angles. Although seeing them in animation was a bit more unnerving, despite how the animation programming seemed choppy and shaky, like the game wasn't made for it. But what was different was that I would be there and flash in the static every now and then. A more prominent notice is the Jirachi was in some of the frames too, without its eye. It seemed to be tortured more than murdered, though. Some scenes were where it was drowning in a lake of blood, a stake-like thing impaled through where its stomach would be, it being hung from some ceiling, and a whole variety of others. But it looked like it was suffering and just couldn't die, no matter what happened to it. It ended after taking its dear, sweet time. Once back on the ground, Berber started to charge for an attack. He fired a bolt of lightning and struck the projector. The screen went black, then back to the body-fueled fire. Except the projector was gone, and everything was darker. A more gray tone. Brever started painfully strolling through the forest and back to the bus stop, all with that face void of emotion. Back home, Brever started running around and I wanted to take my time before our next outing. I browsed around the room, now completely immune to its ghastly interior, and found a binder. I opened it to find a bunch of Pokemon cards, except each and every Pokemon in it was morbidly disfigured. There was an oddish brown and wrinkled like a dried prune, maggots crawling out of its eye sockets, and other slashes in its carcass. Magby was hung from the collar-like thing on its neck, only a few tendons connecting its head to its frail body. In a mylotic card, it looked like a dried-out snakeskin, pus leaking from several cracks along its flesh. Puchiana looked like a pile of roadkill, mangy, blood-clotted fur with flies floating around it and foam at the mouth. Vulpix had an oily-like substance dripping from its mouth and black, soulless eyes. And of course, the Jirachi card looked like the demented version of it I was getting used to. 
But the one that genuinely gave me chills was the Pikachu. It was curled up in a ball with its eyes closed, floating in a red fleshy void and bobbed up and down. As I moved the card around with the control stick, it reminded me of a fetus still in the womb, which quite frankly creeped the hell out of me. More so on a personal level than the other cards, so I hastily changed it. Once I was done browsing the card collection, which was pretty quick, I exited out to find Brever holding one of those morbid Pikachu dolls. He looked somber and walked around slowly with it for a minute, looking like a lost child for his mother, then turned to me. He walked up to me and asked a question in text. Do you know what's happening to me? It didn't talk in the third person perspective like before, so this was a fourth wall breaker for me. I selected X because, quite frankly, I still didn't have much of a clue as to what was going on at all. He sighed and looked despondent and defeated. He set down the doll then ran out the door, I following in tow. At the bus stop, we hopped on the bus to Cobalt Coast. The beach was littered with bodies and the water bloody, a perfect vacation destination. Before I could get a good examination of the place, Brever ran out into the ocean. He sprinted way far out there and then started swimming, and eventually on out of my sight. Screen faded to black, then back. And when it came to, the sky was gray, and everything was in a darker tone. He came swimming back to shore. His face looked fearful, an emotion I hadn't seen from him yet. A message appeared atop the screen. Brever tried to wash the pain away. It didn't work. He walked slowly back to the bus, looking around every few seconds like he'd saw something who knows how awful in that ocean, and it might come back to get him. Once into the bus, and back at the house, he still seemed a bit paranoid. I myself felt pretty good, because that was the shortest outing yet. I selected the Pokemon Mini that was sitting next to the binder since I didn't get to check it out before. There were six games to choose from, so I picked a random one on the bottom left. When the game started, it was a glitched mess. I was surprised I could find the start button. Once it started, the background to it was solid black, with a pair of sharp teeth floating in it. A heart appeared below it, and I pressed A. The fangs opened and closed like it was eating it, and a positive bleep sounded, so I assumed I did whatever it was right. I kept eating the hearts for a couple of seconds until an eyeball appeared. When I ate it, the minigame glitched out into a chaotic mess even worse than before, along with a high-pitched noise that grated my eardrums. I quickly mashed a variety of buttons until I exited out of the mess and was back in the room. Brever was standing in front of the back door, and I knew what that meant before he even opened it and went to the bus stop. This time we went to Mount Snowfall. It was snowing softly and frostbitten bodies were piled halfway under the snow. I felt more sad here than anything. It wasn't grotesque or brutal like the other places, but more of like a sad graveyard. Brother seemed to feel the same as he slowly and carefully treaded through the snow over to the next section and into a temple dubbed by the game, the Ruins of Truth. Inside it was pitch black. Brever walked over to the left to find two what I assume would be flowers, except they had eyeballs instead of petals. He charged up an electric attack and fired it at one which caused it to glow and illuminate the room in a dark red hue. He lit up the other one, which made the room even brighter. The room was still fairly dark. The red hue just seemed to make it more ominous. Brever walked over the bridge and to the other side, where a tall stone tablet was sitting with a big O and X button. I selected it and a question appeared. Redemption? 
I suddenly felt very anxious and bit my lip, unsure of how to answer. I selected O and hoped for the best. Brever walked up and pressed the O button. The tablet sank into the ground. The pillar surrounding the now hole in the ground suddenly lit up, and I felt a pit form in my stomach. The ground shook as something started to rise from the hole, although Brever didn't even flinch. Out of the hole rose the demented Jirachi. Text appeared on top of the screen. There is no redemption. The eyeball on the Jirachi's stomach rose over its head, and just when I was about to cover my eyes, the screen cut to black. When I came back, it was on the egg channel. The same egg from before was still on there. Before I could react, the bleeding egg started glowing and then hatched. Out popped a Jirachi. A normal, non-mentally scarring Jirachi. It flew off the screen and then the channel changed like when you're watching TV on a full screen with Pikachu. It went to a static channel titled 444. The background was red, fleshy, and throbbing, just like in that Pikachu card. Speaking of the devil, Brever was in the middle of the screen, too. Text appeared at the top of the screen. Brever will never be born. He closed his eyes, gave a wide, sharp-fanged grin, and the eyeball that had been haunting me the whole game opened up on its stomach. As soon as it appeared, it was gone, and the game was back on the title screen, the continue button still missing. I sat there dumbfounded for at least a good, solid five minutes. It was as if all the horror I had just witnessed was finally crashing down on me, and I was petrified, afraid to move a muscle. Despite everything rational inside my mind screaming at me, You're an idiot! I tentatively started to select the new game option. Hey, um, Mom? Why are you in my room? The tension broke, and I had to cover my mouth to keep from screaming. I sighed in extreme relief when I saw it was just my son at the door, looking at me like I belonged in a mental asylum, which at the moment I felt like I did. I noticed it was getting late and told him to go to my room and wait for me there. He agreed, although still obviously confused. I'd ask him questions later, but for the moment, I took the CD from the GameCube. I turned around to go throw this thing in the trash can where it belonged, but I was cut short. In the mirror was the Jirachi Eye.